Okay, so we're going to start with some introductions. If you can each take a couple minutes and introduce yourself to your company, tell us a little bit about your role. Hi, my name is Art Smith. I'm the Senior Vice President of Superior Appalachian Pipeline. We're the Appalachian Midstream Division of Superior Pipeline. Uh, Superior is based out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. We've been here in Appalachia since, well, commercially active since 2009. Our first assets were operational in 2010. So time goes kind of fast. It's, what, 2022 now? We've been, we've been around a little while. So uh, our largest asset is called our Pittsburgh Mill System. It's in Allegheny, Butler County, PA. We have other uh, gathering assets in Tioga County, Center County, and also the gathering asset in uh, Preston County, uh, West Virginia. Um, we have about a $100 million credit facility. We've been actively looking for acquisitions over the last six years plus since I've been with the company. Uh, continue to do that. So if you have a really great asset for sale, at a great price, come see me. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here, happy to represent Superior, and uh, excited to see what the rest of this year in 2023 will bring. Thank you, Art. My name is Dustin Vincent, um, engineering manager uh, for MPLX. Uh, we have a, a good turnout today of MPLX employees, so uh, definitely thank you to the employees and everybody that came out uh, to this event today. Um, MPLX, you know, for anybody in the room that, that may not know, uh, we're the midstream processing arm of Marathon Petroleum. Marathon Petroleum, uh, myself, I'm a former Mark West employee. Um, and Marathon purchased Mark West several years back and also Endeavor and some other smaller midstream processing uh, companies and put together the MPLX uh, portion of Marathon Petroleum. So we do midstream processing. Um, obviously the producers uh, do the drilling and, and bring the gas to us and we have some gathering systems in, in Ohio and PA and West Virginia. Uh, we don't have the gathering systems but we do have the processing facilities. So. Um, that's that's our main role. My role within the, the company is on the engineering and construction side for the East Region uh, with pipelines, uh, and some of our group is is here today. Um, again, uh, myself, um, you know, I've been in the industry uh, with MPLX slash Mark West now for about ten years. With was with Dominion Transmission prior to that. Uh, see some former workers with Dominion here as well today. Uh, and then I also did about 13 years in, in consulting on the consulting side in the industry uh, prior to going to Dominion. So I've seen a little bit of both sides of it. Um, but uh, appreciate Sam asking us and Drew asking uh, me to be here today. Uh, and I'll pass it on to Dan Rollins. Yep. Yep, and I'd like to thank Sam as well because a, a friend in need is a pest and uh, she needed a speaker today, so <laughs> here I am. <laughs> thank you, Sam. Um, Dan Rollins, Director of Engineering, DT Midstream. Um, I guess a little bit about DT Midstream. Um, we started out as part of um, Detroit Thomas Edison, um, electric utility, 100-year-old company. Uh, about 10 years ago, they decided they wanted to get into midstream gathering got into Marcellus and Utica, Pennsylvania, uh, acquired assets in, in uh, Michigan's Antrim Shale, um, West Virginia, and, and now in the Haynesville in Louisiana. Um, so been very busy all over the place. Um, we're growing, growing very rapidly. Uh, it's very exciting. Um, now, me personally, I've been there for, uh, with DT for about five years, uh, spent five and a half years at Mark West with a, a lot of my Mark West friends are here today uh, and 14 years at Dominion before that. So it's been, uh, been an awful lot of gas industry for me. Okay. I know one mic. Oh, that's we'll work on that. That's fine. Thank you all so much. So the main, one of the main topics that we're here to discuss is COVID. I know we're all tired of the word, but sadly, although it's it should be behind us. It's still having a lot of effect on multiple companies across multiple industries. Tell us a little bit about the impacts, some of the major impacts of COVID on your companies and what you did to mitigate that. All right, well, for me, I think 
during COVID, uh, we all experienced very similar things, right? People are working from home, folks are trying to figure out how do you have business continuity. Um, if you couldn't work from home, if you're working in the field, how do you, how do you maintain you know, safe distance from each other and still get things done? I think we navigated that pretty well. We had you know, some folks get infected. Thankfully, nobody um, passed away. But business continuity was assured. We didn't really have any issues with that. We got a little tight with our operators here in Appalachia. We, we had it going around in the field to the point where uh, Will Lowry and I, Will is on my team, he's somewhere in the audience. We thought uh, we're gonna have to go operate some assets and that's, I'm not an operator, so that was, that was interesting, thinking about how we were gonna handle that. Uh, but, but we weathered the storm, we got to the other side. So when you get to the other side, you start thinking about, well, what's happening now? What, what's changed, right? Before COVID, we had some demand destruction. During COVID, demand destruction. We had uh, a lot of folks downsizing their companies. So you had less employees to do more work. Uh, you had some uncertainty in the marketplace, and then COVID hits, right? So you, so you weather the storm with COVID, and now people are afraid to go to work. They're working from home. You have kind of a change in the marketplace with how people feel about working, or maybe they don't want to work. Maybe they don't have the work ethic they had before. So you have all these factors. You also have uh, inflation, and you have um, challenges with credit, right? Folks don't want to lend oil and gas. Not only that, interest rates are, are increasing. So a lot of different things to navigate. And you know, I think our company's done a really good job at thinking about those things, but it, mostly it's time and money, right? It's almost like a construction project. Everything's going to take longer. Supply chain's an issue. Everything's going to cost more. So how do you roll that into your OPEX, your CAPEX, explain that to your board members, that sort of thing. So luckily, we really haven't had any issues from, the, from a business perspective. We've been forward thinking, looking at these challenges, and just trying to incorporate these things into our, our daily business. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, as Sam said, I mean, some of us, I think, are extremely tired uh, of hearing the word COVID and, and all of the things that go along with that and, and how difficult 2020 and 2021 was. Um, you know, and with MPLX, unfortunately, we did have uh, an employee a fatality with COVID in April of 2020, uh, and, and it was very early on in the process uh, based out of uh, Denver. Um, so Marathon basically told us one day, take your phones and laptops home and, and stay there until uh, further notice. So we had to learn how to adapt and adjust pretty quick. And I think everybody in here you know, was, was definitely uh, part of that. Everybody was going through the unknown, not just our company, but all, the, all of the companies in, in, in dealing with that. Um, so there was a lot of obvious, obvious downside in, in having to be flexible and adjust the way you do business. And I think that uh, our company did an extremely uh, good job in, in getting us through that. I'll be honest with you, before April of 2020, I hadn't heard of Microsoft Teams. I, did, uh, you know, I th didn't even know what it was. They, they got it implemented very quickly on everybody's uh, phones and iPads and, and computers. And you know, looking on it on the backside now, the way all of us conduct business is obviously different. You know, if you, I think if you'd have went in three years ago and said, oh yeah, we can have these conference calls and 30 people on there and all, all 30 of them at a different location, everybody would have thought you were crazy. Uh, but one of the things that everybody has learned how to adapt and move on and we can actually now be very efficient. And it's not just our company, I think a lot of companies now understand that they don't need to have maybe the square footage footprint in, in, in office space that they used to, uh, that they can change things up, maybe have uh, less overhead um, less of a footprint and, and have some remote workers that uh, people have proven that, that it can be successful. And so it, it definitely has changed uh, the landscape of, of our company and how we do business, but really, uh, you know, the country as a whole and how, how business is, uh, is moving forward. So I think there's been a lot of bright spots in that aspect of it. Now, one of the downsides, uh, as Art mentioned, is supply chain. And I think we can all sit here and, and you know, shake our heads and shrug our shoulders at the issues that have been going on with supply chain. And 
that may be a good topic for a whole event on its own. Um, so I, I won't, you know, dive into it too much. But again, that is part of that learning curve is something that used to be a two week lead time on an item is now maybe unobtainable uh, or extremely long leads. Uh, and, and then to get it, you're paying for it. So the budgets uh, and things have had to adjust uh, trying to get the materials and some of those items. All of that has been a learning experience and in a major adjustment uh, as far as how we all do business. And I think that's kind of been one of the biggest impacts that I notice, uh, negative impacts that this has had on, on, on the industry for the last two and a half years is making those adjustments. And unfortunately, you know, some of the overseas containers that, you know, uh, used to come in on a weekly basis that just don't ship anymore and, and, and lowers the amount of a, a available product uh, and all the things that are going into this. So it's, like I said, some positives came out of it, learning how to uh, operate remotely and using teams, I think has been uh, a good sign of showing how all of us can adjust and, and, and move forward and find efficient ways to work. Uh, but then again, obviously there's been downsides that we still haven't uh, worked through yet. And I think supply chain is probably the biggest example of that. I mean, I, I'd say net positive. So there were definitely negatives, but uh, overall as a company, uh, we definitely came out of it better, stronger, made us better. Um, I mean, one of the, the biggest areas was just, we get so much more, I'll just say contribution from all over the company. Uh, it used to be you had to be in the office to really be involved in major projects, decision making, you know, a lot of the meetings. Teams opened that up, leveled the playing field for everybody. If you were in construction, if you were in operations, if you were in a remote location, uh, it used to stink to be on a meeting. Uh, you, people would be talking to a conference, you know, on a telephone. You couldn't tell who was in the room, who was speaking. There were side conversations going on. You couldn't understand it. Um, teams leveled that. I mean, everybody, you could see who was on the meeting, you had a voice, you could talk, you could be heard, you could participate. And that participation um, has made a difference in our company. I think it's made a difference in a lot of companies. Um, you know, everybody's, I'll say they've got a bigger opportunity to contribute now. Um, you know, you got a lot of freedom because we went home for two years, two full years we worked at home. Wow. Um, you got a lot of freedom where you could live. Um, we all went out and did really good work. Um, they trust us more now because of that. Um, we've got project managers that are in field locations, that are in different offices. Um, engineers can be anywhere. Um, just, you don't have to be anchored to certain reporting locations anymore. And I, I think that's, that's really important for everybody. It's better to have the right person at the wrong location on teams than putting somebody in your office and they're, and they're not the right fit. Um, you know, so that's, it, it's been, we're a lot stronger today because of it. Uh, one of the negatives, and Art, you mentioned it, I wasn't allowed to go out in the field for two years. I, I don't think I ever went a month without going in the field. Uh, we got out of the habit, we stopped traveling, we stopped going to other locations. Um, you learn more in the field in a day than you do in six months in the office. So <coughs> trying to get- Sorry. Younger employees, younger engineers, get them out in the field, get them to interact with construction operations. We've lost some of that. We're trying to get that back. Yeah, I'll add something else too. Yeah, something I wanted to talk about, and, and you know, I think not long ago, maybe it was last month, maybe it was this month. I think it was Mental Health Awareness Month, something like that. You know, folks don't like to talk about anxiety, fear, depression, things like that. But but when you think about the season that we're coming out of, a lot of folks are caught up in that, right? So anxious to be around people, you know, maybe anxious to travel, like you're talking about, um, fear that they're going to get sick, whatever the case may be. So I think as we look at our employees and folks on the teams that, you know, like, like you're talking about, as folks try to get back into the field, try to get to do things together, I think we have to be mindful as leaders that some folks might have anxiety about that. I know for me, I had some anxiety about really getting back out there and mixing it up and, and not being amongst groups for a couple years. Some of those social skills get a little rusty too, right? Like 
oh, like listen to people around the table, look them in the eye. I mean, there, there are a lot of things to think about from, a, you know, a social aspect and a mental health aspect. Maybe, maybe we didn't have to before. So, yeah, I would just encourage you to be mindful of your, your teammates and folks that you lead. They, they may have some anxiety around these things uh, moving forward. Yeah, if I yeah, I'll just add a little bit onto what Art was saying and kind of echo a little bit of that. He made some he made some great points uh, there as far as being mindful of employees and, and trying to recognize that. Uh, and it, it was bringing to my mind um, a lot of the experiences that we had through the two year time frame going through that. Everyone is on a different path to get to that same reconciliation, and everybody's path is one. Some people are a little faster, and some people are a little slower. Um, and, and you know, you guys, everybody sitting in this room probably knows a month or two into this thing in 2020, some, you know, some of us were like, okay, I, I get it. I see what it is. Let's, let's get back to life. Let's get back to it. Um, others, you know, wanted to stay away from everybody else for a year or more. And really it's times have changed that, that, that there's, there's going to be variants. There's going to be issues. There's going to be things out there that you can catch and get sick. Everybody's going to adapt that mentality of saying this is what we have to deal with at a different pace, and you know, we dealt with that out in the field and, and with our contractors. We kept working through this phase, and, uh, I, and I have to give them all credit for working with us because none of us really knew what was going on. We were going by, you know, regulations and guidelines that were being put out in the public, and you know. It, I feel horrible for them at times, but it was guidelines that we put out, but we had uh, pipeline construction workers working out in the field, sometimes 95, 100 degree days, and we're making them wear masks and gaiters pulled up around their face and everything else. And um, But it, you know, until we had a handle on it and understood what was going on, that's the guidelines that were put forth and that's what we had to do. Uh, and again, um, it's knowing and showing that patience because, you know, in, in, people had patience and working with us on those requirements until we came up with better requirements space and get those gathers off of them that type of thing but uh, one of the things that we did find and, and I recognize and I think most do is that everyone processes at that different pace and I think that's a, a really good uh, point to make is to still keep that in mind because um, you know it's it's here it's it's a thing we've all probably known people that have been affected by it one way or another, whether it was severe or, uh, or, or what, um, and that potential's there, and how people process that are different. So I think he makes a, a very good point. I think as, as business leaders and as businesses moving forward, everybody kind of has to keep that in mind, and there's no wrong or, or right way to process it, fast or slow or whatever. Nobody's wrong in how they do it. It's just everybody's different in, in that aspect, and it's a good point to, you know, be patient with your with your fellow co-worker, I guess, is the best way to put it. Any questions so far regarding what they've just touched on? I have a question. So I heard all three of you really talk about the new world where Teams is available for everyone. And we're able to work with individuals that prior to COVID may not have had the opportunity to be part of our Teams. Can any of you comment on how do you stay engaged? How do you, as leaders within your companies, how do you connect, keep that connection with employees beyond teams? Whereas before we would have the opportunity to stand face to face in front of each other like we are right now. And that does have a significant difference. So how do you reach that employee that benefits more from the one-on-one -on -one contact versus now being over teams? So I think uh, anytime someone's in management, one of the things that they have to learn to be good at, if they're not naturally good at it, is how to read their coworkers. Um, and, it, and it goes back to what I was just saying about how everybody processes differently, everybody works at different paces. Same thing with personalities. Uh, all coworkers all have different personalities, and you, you bring up a great question with that, Sam, is that. Um, you know, you've heard people in the industry use the terms high maintenance or low maintenance. I, I don't think that's usually the best term, but some people do, personality-wise, like to have more of that interaction. 
I have an employee that calls me at least five days a week by seven in the morning. He wants to talk about what's going on for the day, wants to, you know what I mean, just a quick 10 minute conversation. Um, and that's expected. I know that phone's ringing at that time, and it, you know, and it works great. I have others that I can go all week long, I'll call them up, I'll say, listen, I know we haven't talked all week. You know what I mean, how's things going on? It's just, that's different personalities. Both are extremely effective at what they do in, in doing their job. And I think uh, as a manager, it's trying to recognize that with each person. Uh, and some people, sometimes you still need to make the trip, make the one-on-one -on -one connections, have the face-to-faces so many times. Um, but others, to be honest, are, you know, we call self-starters and, you know, loners. Just it, it, you go through the different personality types. Um, you know, I don't know if you've ever done the Myers-Briggs type of evaluations and that kind of thing. Those things are, it's, it's pretty interesting and neat, but they are uh, pretty effective, to, you know, way to learn it. Um, people, are, people are different, and I think a lot of it is recognizing that and then trying to meet them where they are. And if it's a person that needs a little bit more interaction or if there's a group that needs it, then schedule those face-to-face -face meetings as often as you think you need to. But uh, it's, it's reading the group as a whole and then just trying to trying to meet them at the place that works the best. Yeah, I had an interesting one. One of my, my employees said this to me. I never really even thought about it. So we're, we're in a hybrid uh, work schedule. We're in the office. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, work from home Monday and Friday. And he said, it's easier for me to get you on Monday and Friday on Teams than it is to catch you in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. It's like we're in here a shorter amount of time, you're bouncing all over the place. It's like I can't corner you when we're in the office. But I see your light screen on Teams and I know where I can get you. You know. Huh. I, so that, that kind of struck me as something I hadn't really considered. Um, you know, just kind of adding to Dustin, um, we've got people who want to go back five days a week. We've got people who never want to come back. We've got people who like hybrid, so it's it's all over the place. I'm going to give a whole different take on the Teams thing. So uh, I'm a conference call fan, mostly because when I'm on conference calls, I can pay attention when I need to <laughs> and not pay attention when I don't need to. So, you know, we have a small team here in Appalachia, and when, when I'm involved in corporate things, usually I can chime in when I need to chime in and keep working because I need to get stuff done while I'm also participating in corporate things. Well now, Teams means, well, I keep a dress shirt in my office and I have to be on camera making sure I'm paying attention to what everybody's saying, even if it doesn't apply to me and our business here. So. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting, different dynamic. It has been good to, to participate in meetings. You know, we've, we've had you know, high-level meetings at the company where it's good to see people and their body language, right? How are, they, how are they responding to a question or something that's being brought up? Uh, so I think it's been useful from, from that perspective. It, it is handy to talk to folks, uh, you know, on camera from time to time, but I do find myself probably once a week saying, yeah, use a conference call. It could be a lot easier. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, our next question for you all is what recommendations do you have for your contractors, your vendors? You have a room here of a lot of different companies that all provide different services to your three companies. So we would love to hear what recommendations do you have for the vendors that are trying to stay competitive in a market that's very difficult to stay competitive in post-COVID. What can we do to better present ourselves and still stay as competitive as we need us to be? <laughs> uh, it to you. Uh, yeah, take that. And relationships matter. Um, you know, we're working from home, we couldn't meet people. Um, if we had a pre-existing relationship, um, that went a long way. Uh, if you text me, if you call me, you're going to get <coughs> if, I, if I know who you are. We have a relationship already. Um, I think communication matters uh, a lot right now because um, crazy things happen with supply chain every day. What your guys' capability is, what you can do, what you can't do. And we really need direct kind of answers on stuff like that. Can you can you hit this deadline or can't you? Can you provide this? Is it going to come from a country I'm really not comfortable with? 
we're, don't presume that we're going to decide <coughs> a certain way because we're being put in really weird situations every day. And, um, and I, I bought fittings from Thailand this week and I, I never thought I would do that. Um, so we're in tough spots, um, communicate and, and relationships matter. Yeah, I think Dan really hit the nail on the head uh, with that one, with, with both of those points. Um, you know, it, from, from our perspective, and you can probably tell by our introduction, Dan and I have worked together, both Mark West and Dominion over the years, and, and, and had a lot of the similar experiences and relationships with a lot of the vendors. Um, a lot of times it's just that small text message or email or phone call, just keeping in touch. Um, you know, just reaching out and being in the back of the mind, um, not not saying, you know, to be a pest or anything on that level, but it is amazing how uh, we'll be out there, something will pop up. Um, I'll use Ernie over there, as so I think clear at, the, clear at the back table in NDT services for us, and uh, he reaches out and texts now and again. It's one of them things where something will pop up, I'll be out there and somebody says, man, we need to get a hold of somebody, come do this NDT, and blah, blah, blah. Well, when you had some house, I said, yeah, Ernie just shot me a text message the other day, he said, if anything we can do for you, let me know. A lot of times it's just that simple. That's the first person that pops in your mind. Um, it's just having those relationships and keeping the, that chain of communication and that contact open. Um, like Dan says, it's not like we usually predetermine or, pre I mean, a lot of times you'll have your go-tos, but when you're thinking of something and it's there in front of you and it's happening on the fly, then you're thinking, oh yeah, so-and-so just reached out and said they do this and would be willing to do it and you pick up the phone and you give them a call and that's how a lot of it happens and, and goes down um, so you know really a, you don't need to be face to face for that team still works emails texts um, and again really just saying hey you know we provide these services uh, we're here if you need us give us a call simple things like that that I couldn't name how many times has, has come back to where I thought about okay that person did just touch base last week and give them a call and take it from there. So I think what Dan's saying it definitely holds true is just keep keeping that communication open. Yeah, I think to do what you say you're going to do is all, you know, always applies. It doesn't really matter uh, about the environment, but it, it becomes more difficult, just like it's more difficult for us to perform because of time, cost, and everything else. We understand that it's challenging for the vendors too. So I think being mindful about that, making sure that you can deliver on what you say you can deliver on is really important. Um, you know, I, but thinking about what you're saying on staying in contact, there's kind of a fine line, isn't there? There is, that's right. You know, I, I, I've been overwhelmed before, which I don't love, right? I do remember a story. Oh, there's no one in this room, so I think I can share this. So, um, you know, we, we do pipelines, compressor stations, that kind of thing, and we'll bid out that work to construction companies and whoever else. So uh, we had put a bid list together, reached out to a bunch of folks, and then I saw somebody at an event I hadn't seen in a while. I said, oh, man, we forgot to put you on the list. He goes, don't ever tell my boss that. <laughs> like, I'm supposed to be contacting you enough that I'm top of mind for you, and I wasn't. So, you know, kind of keep it between us that, that you forgot to add me on the bid list. But yeah, it goes right to what you're saying about, you know, stay, staying in contact and, and uh, you know, staying top of mind, so to speak. So we're gonna take this one step further than what I had emailed to you a few days ago, so apologies. So are, have you given any consider, or are any considerations being given to the fact that it's taking a much higher investment to maintain the same levels of service. So staying in contact is great. A lot of folks here that are in business development hopefully are doing that well. But once we are in there, right? Once we're there, we're trying to provide a service for you and we're, every person in this room wants to make sure that they're doing the best job possible. So taking it a step beyond that, with the current with our industry facing the challenges that it's facing and costs climbing across the board and the supply chain issues, it's not as easy to stay financially as competitive as it was a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. So what stands out for each of you when 
we're beyond the bid process, you have the bid list, what stands out, what are you looking for as far as capabilities? Um, safety, for instance, I know, you know, at Mido, safety is a, a top priority. What are things that are important to you beyond the communication? You have to be careful with that, otherwise you're gonna walk out of the store and your folks are gonna be going crazy. <laughs> on field model. No, that's, that's a great question. Um, obviously the landscape has changed as a result of all this. Uh, prices have increased, again, like we talked about with supply chain and lead times and, and everything that has increased. Um, to me, I think, uh, goes a little bit to what Art was just saying as well, is what saying what you'll do and then delivering on it. Um, then I'll take that one step further and that's upfront honesty. And, and so for uh, a, a, an owner perspective, from a gas company perspective, all these projects are looked at on an individual basis with an ROI. What is the return on investment? So we have to know at the beginning of it what those upfront costs are. And, and unfortunately, I think a lot of businesses and, and vendors or suppliers or that type of thing may be nervous about saying, hey, unfortunately our costs have doubled or this is what it is. And we get hit with it on the back end we start finding out things further. We need to know up front, and it, it, it is what it is. It's not, we all know it's not somebody wanting to do it. It's just the cost of things and, and, and the way the world has taken a turn. Having that information up front, then letting upper management or the board of directors or whoever it needs to be to sit and look at it and say, okay, here's what it's gonna cost. Here's what we'll get. Here's what that percent ROI is gonna be, and we wanna move forward with it. That keeps a good relationship. It's the situations you get into thinking you're doing a project at one return, get all kinds of hidden costs thrown in halfway through or at the end, changes the whole dynamic, the decision may have been different. Those are the type of things that relationships are ruined pretty quickly. So to me, it, it still goes back to delivering what you say, but honestly, up front, honestly, getting all that out uh, on the front so the decision can be made and then sticking with it, and I think relationships can be good. I mean, execution plan, whether it's engineering, construction, equipment supply, I'm gonna look at your execution plan every bit as closely as your cost. And, um, and it comes down to, do I think you can do it? How confident am I? And at the end of it, I, it's more about what I'm getting than what it costs. And I, I say that we still get a little better, but not as often as, as most people would think. Um, a lot of times it's just a feel of how well do you sell what it is that you're going to provide. And, and that, that means as much as the cost does. That's perfect, thank you. It's helpful to hear your thoughts on that, especially now post-COVID. There are so many things that are handled so differently. So it's a good reminder to everyone in this room and it's helpful, hopefully it helps you all as well. Hopefully it puts a bug in everybody's ear. Let's go into 2023. Now, now that we have managed getting to the point that we're at now, beyond COVID, you've mitigated all the issues, you've, you've put plans in place to where you can communicate, whether it's in person or via Teams, and business has to continue, right? Growth has to continue. Can you tell us a little bit about the 2023 outlook? And if there's a project that you can highlight, that would be wonderful. I'm bullish on that from gas, and I'm bullish on Appalachia. So I, I think we have, you know, a great road in front of us. Yeah, we're constrained from a macro perspective. We can't get gas out of the basin. I really like EQT's, Toby's message about unleash US LNG. You know, I think there's political support behind that. We can hopefully get that done. Uh, but there's great opportunity here. E even just continuing to keep our, you know, whatever, the Appalachian flows are at 35, 36 BCF a day. <coughs> Keeping those volumes up requires quite a bit of drilling, so a lot of work for all of us. Uh, so, you know, for us personally, as Superior, we expect some growth in 23 and 24. We're excited about that. You know, I like to think macro, micro, macro, we're constrained, micro, hey, we might have some systems that have a lot of activity. So, uh, it, you know, I, I think it's good for us. Gas prices, you know, I think they're going to moderate a little bit, but. I hope, I'm hoping they're not going to be down in that dollar, two dollar range uh, much in the future. So, uh, you know, I think we're excited about where we're at and, and what's happening here in Appalachia. Thank you. 
Yeah, as far as uh, MPLX as a company, um, 2023 looks to be a little bit better than what 2020 and 2021 were, uh, and, and a tad more than, than, than this year uh, in, in 22. Now, one thing that MPLX uh, kind of has going for us right now is we, we have capacity. Um, in, in some plants more than others, and in locations and pipelines, some places more than others. But with the amount of construction that we did over a 10 year period, uh, we've kind of built ourselves up into, you know, where, where we have some uh, capacity available. So that instead of building right up to the minute now, with a peak and drilling and some gathering coming in, we can handle that as we still continue to look for future uh, limits and, and can plan a little bit better versus, you know, last minute reactive, uh, the way things were for a long time there. Um, we still have some great projects uh, coming in 2023, I think. You know, the Timberlake compressor station, the high pressure and low pressure gathering lines that are associated with that, uh, you know, good projects that are, that are happening. We have a good bit of other gathering lines uh, that are coming as part of 23 as well. Uh, but then to add on to what Bart is saying, you know, industry as a whole uh, in, in this region, um, it, it continuing to look like it's moving up. Uh, and obviously the, the potential's there. We all are kind of watching what's going on with the, the world stage uh, with energy and availability and that type of thing. And a lot of it obviously comes down to at the national level and, and what's decided and, you know, MVP pipeline, for example, if that can be uh, finished and open up and give us some outlet. But, um, you know, even with that uh, and the, the worldwide energy needs, I think things still look bright for the East currently. Yeah, it's, it's picking up. Um, we've got nine compressor stations that are greenlit and we're, we're working on right now. Um, one in PA, one in Ohio, two in West Virginia, three in West Virginia, and um, the rest are in Louisiana. Um, a lot of gathering systems, gathering pipeline going in in Ohio, Pennsylvania, or Ohio and West Virginia. Um, so 23 is on an upswing in the Marcellus and Utica. And it, it kind of it's a little bit of a boom and a bust cycle, so we're kind of on an upswing again. Um, having lived through the, the boom of 12, 13, 14, 15, and, and the Marcellus in Utica, I, I never thought I never thought I'd lived through that once, and it's going on again in the Haynesville. 22 has been outrageous in the Haynesville. Next year's going to be even worse. We're building um, multiple treating facilities down there, um, large plants um, on, on the cryo plant size scale. Um, we're expanding every plant we have down there. We're building, we're looping 36 inch lines and 20 inch lines, um, very close to the LNG terminals in the Gulf. Uh, it is just going bonkers down there right now. And it's kind of amazing. Um, that doesn't look like that's going to stop anytime soon. That's, that's a 22, 23, 24. And we've got projects approved into 24 Really, that's because that's all the farther producers will look out is about 24 months. So it's um, it's definitely, you know, I can't speak to the Permian, but boy, the Haynesville is really hot right now. All very exciting, thank you. So one of our final questions for the three of you is any personal thoughts on the upcoming election, understanding that this is a personal opinion does not in any way represent their company. So any thoughts on the upcoming election and the possible effects, whether it's positive or negative, that it can have on our industry? Go vote. <laughs> <laughs> that might be just the best way to keep with it. <laughs> I, know, I know Jeremy Smith's back here fist bumping me, so uh, Full, full disclosure, I just finished last year. I had eight years of an elected uh, office locally where, where I'm from. So uh, me jumping into the political side of it may go for the next three hours if I get uh, get, get riled up too much. But um, what Art said, go vote. Uh, it does matter. It, it, it really does. And, you know, so do, do some research. And, and to me, um, I think that's what it's all about. Find out who it is that represents what you believe are important topics. Um, dive into it, find out what they're about. Uh, you know, that's one of the unfortunate things I think in, in our society is that too many people 
do what I call single issue voting. They hear one hot topic, means a lot to them, and that's all that matters. And they're gonna run to the polls and vote, vote just based on that one hot topic where if they dive into it and really start finding out what each person's about and that type of thing, it, it may change their views. So uh, obviously the more educated you can make yourself on what you think will affect your life, which viewpoints coincide with yours the most, uh, do, the, do the research is my advice and, and try to find those candidates that line up with your line of thinking and then, and then go vote accordingly. Yeah, go vote. <laughs> This is your idea, well, too. I expected yeah, a little bit more than that. I'll give a little more. There so I think, you know, what's really interesting, a lot of our industry groups have PACs. So the, when you think about these politi what's it, political action, when you think about that, sometimes you would expect, now, obviously, we're not, a lot of these PACs aren't taking into account broader views about how someone feels about a particular issue. But industry PACs are taking into account how candidates uh, be able to represent our industry, right? the energy industry. So I'm always a little surprised when I see who the PACs are backing, right? It's not always from one party, sometimes it's multiple parties. Uh, so I think it goes to what, what you're saying is if you really dive in, you really get, get to know who the candidates are and what they support or don't support, <coughs> it may surprise you as you're preparing to go vote. Uh, so that's all I wanted to add. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on a little bit more. I'll jump on a little bit more with it. Um, but no, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier about different people, different personality types, um, everybody has a different way of thinking. Um, to me, I just wish that government would give us a set of rules to play by and then let us go accordingly. And, and what I mean by that, some of the things that upset me the most that's been going on over the last couple of years, you know, we have environmental permitting defined and in place. You know what I mean? As a, as a company that goes out and does, builds natural gas pipelines, I don't mind having to go out and do the bat misnet studies and see, see if there's any other bats out there. I don't mind having to do the environmental studies. Give us the playbook and the set of rules and because none of us want to be bad stewards and go out and rip and tear up things and, tear up streams and wildlife and everything else. I don't think there's anybody that sets out saying, hey, let's, let's, let's go make things miserable uh, for our surroundings and our, and our area that we live. Um, we want to do things responsibly and do them the way the permit lays out. What I'm upset about over the last couple of years is the ones that now go pull that process and put a halt to that process. But to put it out there, if there's certain things that you want protected and taken care of, go through the process, have that installed in the permit, but then let companies apply accordingly and then build according to those parameters. And, and to me, I'm looking for candidates that are gonna stick to that. I'm not saying I want candidates that wanna go out and just get rid of all permitting, let everybody rip and tear. There's reasons for every single thing that's in place is because of irresponsibility somewhere previous. That's every rule that's put in place is, has somebody's name to it. Um, they're there for a reason, but give us those rules. Let us then navigate the game and move on. It's pulling those away once a permit's issued, pulling it back, that type of thing. I disagree with that, and I think that uh, myself, I look for candidates that you know are, are fine with putting in a set of rules and, and then letting it move on and, and, and adhering to those. Okay. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> So that's all we have for you guys. This is your opportunity to ask any questions or add any comments. So uh, this is kind of a long question, but I'd really love to hear your opinion on the war, the, the war on fossil fuels is, is immense, right? Now. We're using it as a weapon, right? Uh, Pennsylvania could be possibly joining RGGI. I know we'll lose the room on RGGI. It's a very important thing. Regional gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then the third thing is FERC is now controlled three to two, uh, more, more Democratic than Republican. Um, we used to get permits all the time for the, uh, through FERC. FERC is not approving anything. Uh, MVP, your guess is as good as mine. Um, so, as, as oil and gas people, I know you guys aren't the CEOs, uh, 
uh, we're seeing Nick Ju Ju Julius out there, we're seeing Toby Rice really speaking up. Alan Armstrong from Williams last week, I was very surprised he spoke up. Where's, where's the time that we draw the line and say it's enough is enough? We can only do so much of this ESG, and we start hearing the leaders of our industry really fight back a little bit. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> sure, I'll jump. Yeah, I think that expands really on a little bit of what I was talking about uh, with the permits. And, and instead of sitting on them, not approving them, if there are concerns, and we'll just use a stream crossing as an example, whether you have a 50 foot buffer and you can't get into the stream, or if you do open cut it, have it back in position by 24 hours, or you can't open cut it, you got to board it. That's all fine, but give the parameters and then let them stay in place. It's when you go to pull it and stop all production that I, I cannot agree with it. So to me, uh, the sides that have the concerns, find an answer that addresses the concern. And if that means taking the buffer from a stream from 50 to 100, that's gonna increase our costs, obviously. Now your borders are gonna get longer. But the bottom line is, there needs to be rules to play by. And, and there can be rules set in place that protect what needs to be protected, that still gives both sides of the issue, so to speak, what they want. And if that's the protection, uh, that can be achieved. But holding it up, and I think you hit on it very early on, is, it's, it's, it's kind of a war on it. And the way I personally see it, I'm just talking from a personal perspective, if we're using energy equivalents and natural gas is $3 for an energy equivalent, and wind and solar is $8. Most people are gonna say, yeah, I'd rather get my energy through gas. To me, I think you find ways to make wind and solar more efficient so it gets closer to the three to become competitive versus pulling permits and halting things on this so that it gets up closer to the eight. I think by doing that, whoever's buying from either one of them ultimately loses because it's more expensive. But unfortunately, that's how I see the processes going on by putting stops on things for this one to make it more expensive, maybe makes this look a little better in comparison. I just think that's the opposite way it should be approached. Put some research, put some energy into finding out what you can do efficiency-wise to make those more competitive and efficient, and I think you'd, you'd have an answer. Yeah, I think it's something we've talked about at the corporate level is, we've always had ESG, so when you think about stewardship of the environment and what we do for our employees and what we do for you know the places where we work and the governance structures it's always been there so it's, it's kind of uh, the way you track it the way you explain it to the marketplace so that, that's kind of our view I think we are taking more steps to do certain things um, relative to giving back more to the community uh, really tracking progress on emissions reductions, things like that. I think there's a net benefit to it. Now, Mark, I think the part that you're talking about might be, uh, you know, the tenacity around folks that are saying, hey, we can't invest in fossil fuels because, you know, they're, they're bad for the environment, that, you know, ESG investors don't want to invest there. It's kind of, we're, we're kind of viewing that as something of, you know, a little bit separate. You're gonna have your activist investors, you're gonna have folks that act that way. I think you have some states like West Virginia and Texas stepping up and saying, hey, if you're not gonna invest in, in these companies, we're gonna not do business with your banks, things like that. You have these CEOs, major corporations now standing up for our industry, which is a good thing. And I, I think the timing's right, you know, when the producer, or, or, or when customers start to get impacted and when economics don't make sense, things start to turn, and I, I think we're there, right? Customers are being impacted. The explanations they're getting for the ones that care to think about it at all don't make sense, right? So you, you get to a point to where folks have said, hey, enough is enough, right? This is, we're not getting the facts, we're not getting the truth. Uh, we're being hit in the wallets and we don't understand why. Uh, so I, I, think, I think the environment is right such that pendulum's gonna swing back our way a little bit. And we're gonna be able to make positive improvements because of ESG initiatives, but also be able to continue to grow our business. If you think about fuel switching, for instance, you know, 
One of the reasons that we've improved so much in CO2 emissions in, in the U.S. is because we fuel switch from coal to, to natural gas, right, for, for power generation. Well, I keep talking to a lot of, a lot of folks uh, that I talk to don't understand the, the market dynamics. So if you look at uh, the demand for electricity, it's expected to increase tremendously, right? Well, renewables, even if they grow exponentially, aren't going to cover that gap. So what happens when you need more natural gas? So nuclear is a thing. People are afraid of nuclear. Right? Unless nuclear takes off, I think we're going to see more and more demand for natural gas, fossil fuels, and if we're not allowed to extract it, consumers are going to be additionally impacted in the pocketbook. So I think it'll be interesting to see over the next five years, but I, I think it's really headed back our direction. Really, that falls right back into what I was talking about earlier with that return on investment. Now I brought it up then talking about costs from vendors and that type of thing. But all of that still relates. So the different parameters and the, the cost for us to operate and build and construct in each state is different. Each state has different regulations uh, across the board in so many ways. Um, in, in West Virginia, I'll use an example on the ballot coming up next week. They have a, a, a the state amendment about the personal property tax, the legislature being able to remove that personal property tax. One of the few states left, or I think it might be the only state left, um, that's assessing that, and a lot of businesses do not have assets sitting in West Virginia for that reason, uh, because they can be taxed on the personal property side of it. Um, so the fleet vehicles and everything else for a lot of the companies down there from out of state, you know, um, that adds up. And then in, in the mindset of a company about maybe relocating and putting more stuff in that location. So that's just one example. Um, you know, you move up here to Pennsylvania, some of the regulations in this state are much tighter than what they are in neighboring Ohio, even in West Virginia. So now that adds cost. So again, it really just goes back to changing that ROI for projects in that individual state, which is ultimately what decisions are based on. Yeah, I think there's always competition for capital no matter what, right? E even on ESG projects, right? If we're looking at a methane uh, emissions reduction project, where does it make more sense to do it? If we're looking at our, you know, mid-continent assets, if we're looking at our Appalachian assets, where can we have the biggest bang for the buck, right? Uh, that kind of thing. So we're always thinking about that. Appalachia, I, I can say from an acquisition perspective, we've been, we've been more successful getting into uh, and finding acquisitions in the mid-continent because it's it's just a lower cost of entry. So we've been trying to grow here pretty aggressively for, you know, like I said, six to seven years. And the cost of entry is high. So the, that's challenging. But when it comes down to once our agreements are already in place and that kind of thing, it costs more to do things here, but usually the return is worth it. So, you know, it's just a great rock and great resource. So we're willing to endure the pain, so to speak, to, to get it done. Yeah, I'll, I'll say midstream and gathering is competitive everywhere. Um, if there are molecules out there, we're going to chase them. We think we can win in any basin, and, you know, any state, any political background. Um, you know, a counterintuitive way to look at it is the harder it is, Pennsylvania is difficult, Ohio is difficult. We think it's a competitive advantage for us that we know how to handle it and we know how to we know how to work our way through the system. So that's how we look at it. Yes, one last question in the back here. Will you stand up so we can all hear you, please? With the uh, supply chain issues that everyone uh, is, is, are experiencing, have you changed your ROI measurement scheme, or are you still using 2018 ROI? Uh, uh, 
I'll just say for us real quick, our, our expectations on return haven't really changed, but our understanding of what it's going to cost to get things done has changed, as well as our you know, cost of capital to get it done. So, you know, if you think about using a credit facility, it might have been a 3% interest rate two years ago, and you know, now it's 6% and going up. That's so, exactly where I was looking yeah. Yeah, so we're kind of making that in, but uh, it really hasn't changed. It really hasn't changed our viewpoint very much. You know, um, kind of gets baked into the economics. So I can tell you, I'm not in the room for those decisions at the, uh, at the, at the board of directors level, but, but it also goes back to the question that he had earlier. So MPLX, we've got some very busy plays going on in West Texas, North Dakota, and some of the other areas of the country. And you know, for, for our corporate standpoint, for them to look at it and say, well, if I can get a much better, if we're gonna invest this much money, where do we get our better return at? Where's our better investment? Uh, and I think a lot of those things may answer themselves when you look at the amount of work that we have going on in those other areas right now as opposed to, to, to what we have going on in the east. I mean, there's still reasons, just as Dan said, we're going to chase it, but there's still reasons to do projects in the east and to go after it. But when they're looking at where they might want to put that major investment, I think it kind of does speak for itself. And, and uh, some of those other areas right now are definitely outplaying the east region. Yeah, for a company that's spread out all over those areas, it does come into play on those, because you know, where you're going to get a better return on that investment. It's, it's stockholders are happy, it's it really what drives it, you know, it's the bottom line. Thank you. Apologies, it's my responsibility to cut it off, otherwise we can go for another two hours on the same topic. So, let's take a moment and give you three a of applause for you. All right, man. Thank you. 